Hello, everybody. Hi, thanks for coming. I'm glad you came. Uh, anybody who doesn't know me, my name is Tom Renier, and I'm an appellate attorney in South Florida. I have my own practice, Tom Renier Appeals. I do civil and criminal appeals. And um, I've been studying Shakespeare and the law for a long time, and I have taught a course at UM Law School on the subject of Shakespeare and the law. I've written articles on it, and uh, I've given talks on it at very, various places around the country. And this is a continuing legal education program uh, that I worked out. I've given it at several venues so far. And uh, I found that Hamlet is the most interesting play for me as, uh, as far as the law is concerned. And when I taught a course on Shakespeare and the law, I spent a couple of classes just on Hamlet and on the legal issues in it. And in this, I'm just going to touch on some of the legal issues that have to do with the law of homicide and the law of suicide. So the subtitle of my talk is The Life of the Mind in Law and Art. And I think that will become clear as we go along. Now, I want to give you a little road map of what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to be pointing out that Hamlet, the play, is informed by an understanding of changes in the law of homicide that were occurring around the time that the play was written. And the law was moving away from just analyzing actions to analyzing the mind as well. And Shakespeare's works also show a greater emphasis on the mind, so there's a parallel there. Now, for the lawyers here, I'm going to get rid of this threshold question, the choice of law, because you'll notice that I'm going to be talking about English law of homicide, and, of course, Hamlet is set in Denmark, so why would they be using English law? Well, as it happens in Shakespeare's plays, um, English law predominates, even when the play is set in some other country. And that's because Shakespeare understood English law. His audience would understand English law. So you'll, you'll find terms in English law are being used by the characters even when the play is set in some other country. Now, in, uh, the foreign law will be a factor in the play when the play is set in another country. And that's true in Denmark. For example, in Denmark, uh, the Danish king was elected by a council. It wasn't automatic hereditary succession. That's why Hamlet does not automatically become king when his father dies. Uh, so that feature of Danish law does appear in the play. But uh, when we talk about law of homicide, and there's also a lot of property law in Hamlet, which I won't get into today, but when we get into that, um, We'll be talking about English law most of the time. Now, I want to talk about the big change that was occurring in the law from the medieval age to the modern age. And I'm indebted to this article by Thomas Glenn Watkin, Hamlet and the Law of Homicide, which was published in 1984. And by the way, I found out from someone who came to one of my presentations who knew Thomas Glenn Watkin. He told uh, Professor Watkin uh, that I was quoting him and he was delighted to hear that anybody was still talking about this article he'd written over 30 years ago. So that was kind of interesting. Uh, the medieval view is well expressed, I think, by Sir Thomas Bryan, who was an important judge in the late 1400s. And he said, the thought of man shall not be tried, for the devil himself knoweth not the thought of man. So they knew that you couldn't read a person's mind, but uh, so they didn't even try. They just said, okay, we're just going to look at actions. We're not going to look at thought. Now, just to show you how much the law changed, about 150 years later, you get this in Sir Edward Cook's Third Institute, and he's talking about murder, and he says, murder is when a man unlawfully killeth a person with malice forethought, either expressed by the party or implied by law. So when we get to that phrase, malice forethought, well, we're starting to look inside the person's mind. Uh, we're starting to look at what they're feeling, what their intentions are, and, and when they thought something. So that's a big difference. And people were starting to realize that you could infer a person's intent from their actions, even though you still can't actually read a person's mind. So let's look at how this affected the law of homicide. Now, under the medieval rule, the key question about whether killing another person was unlawful was whether the person was the king's lawful subject. So you would look at the victim's legal status. 
And king, uh, king's lawful subject was a key phrase that was used in the legal analysis. So if the person was not the king's lawful subject, it was all right to kill them. For example, a highway robber, uh, somebody who breaks into your house at night, uh, an escaping prisoner. These people had forfeited the protection of the king's law by their actions, and therefore, if you had to kill this person, that was fine. Now, what if the person was the king's lawful subject? Well, if you killed the person, that was a crime. Trouble with this is it would come to some results that I think we would find rather anomalous today. For example, uh, an accident. Let's say you're cutting down a tree in the forest, and the, as the tree's falling, someone walks by, and the tree hits them and kills them. Well, of course you didn't mean to kill the person, but hey, it's your actions that count. So whether you meant to or not, uh, it didn't matter. Saying I didn't mean to was not an excuse. So uh, that was uh, still a murder under the law. And also for a long time, self-defense was not a defense to murder. Now, usually, if the jury found that you acted in self-defense, you could ask the king for a pardon and you would usually get it. But it was not an automatic defense to murder. So the modern rule, we're not looking at the victim's legal status anymore. We're looking at the state of mind of the defendant, the person who actually did the killing. And so murder would be killing with malice forethought. Or you might call it cold-blooded murder. Now, just as an aside, that, that phrase cold-blooded uh, was coined by Shakespeare. Shakespeare was the first person to take the word cold and put it together with the word blood and come up with the phrase cold-blooded. And actually, in, in the case where he first used it, it didn't really have anything to do with murder, but it's become associated with that. So really, it's a premeditated murder, a premeditated killing for it to be murder. And premeditated, also another word coined by Shakespeare. Now, under the law, there were a couple of situations where premeditation was presumed. And one of these was if you stabbed an unarmed person or a person who had not yet drawn his sword. So that was considered presumptively premeditated and that was an irrebuttable presumption. You couldn't argue against it. It was automatically murder if you uh, stabbed a per you killed a person who uh, did not have a sword. And also willful killing by poisoning was presumptively premeditated. <laughs> okay, now the following things, under the new rule, under the modern rule, these things were not murder. An accident is not murder under the modern rule because you didn't have the intent. There's no malice of forethought. If it was an accident, you didn't mean to do it. So that did become an excuse. And self-defense eventually became a complete defense to murder. And also another defense to murder was insanity. Again, because you're not able to form the intent. Now, let's see how some of this applies to some of the fact patterns in Hamlet. Now, I'm going to start with the subject of Hamlet's feigned madness. And here we have a picture from Laurence Olivier's film of Hamlet, famous film. And this is where Hamlet is uttering that famous line, I can't tonight, I have a headache. <laughs> But you didn't know that was from Hamlet, did you? <laughs> okay, so let's, let's look back at that, that feigned madness bit in Hamlet. What was going on there exactly? Well, you may recall early on in the play, Hamlet learns from the ghost of his father, no less, that uh, his uncle Claudius had killed his father. And then, of course, Claudius married Hamlet's mother. So he learns of Claudius' treachery, and what does he do? He resolves he's going to kill Claudius, and then he goes and kills Claudius. Oh, no, wait, except then the play would be over. So um, he, he did a few other things first. He uh, put on a play. He took a trip to England, got captured by pirates. Uh, eventually, he got around to killing Claudius, but that was much later. But what does he do right after he learns of Claudius' treachery and decides he's going to kill him? He decides to feign madness. He's going to pretend that he's crazy. Why would he do that? Well, the insane are not considered capable of having malice aforethought. They're just too crazy to form the intent. And therefore, insanity is a complete defense to murder. And there's no punishment, not even loss of goods or chattels. So if he sets up 
this scenario where everybody thinks he's crazy and then he kills Claudius, people will just say, oh, poor Hamlet. He was crazy. He didn't know what he was doing. So uh, he's got a, a defense already lined up. Now, as it happens, long before he kills Claudius, he kills Polonius. And so, of course, he can use the madness defense, which he does use. And also, there's another defense he can use. And that's because of the way Shakespeare manipulated the fact patterns in the play. And let me explain about that a little bit more. In Belfort's version of the Hamlet story, which was published in 1570, and is one of the sources that Shakespeare probably looked at, the advisor character, the forerunner of the Polonius character, hides under a quilt during the closet scene. That's the scene where Hamlet is arguing with his mother. Now, in Shakespeare's Hamlet, Polonius hides behind an arras, a hanging tapestry. Well, what difference does that make? Well, it actually makes a, different, a difference because of the change that was occurring in the law. So let's take a look at those two different scenarios under the different versions of the law. Let's start with the medieval rule. Now remember, under the medieval rule, the first question we're going to ask is, was the victim the king's lawful subject? And if he was, then killing him is a crime. So let's say Polonius is hiding under a quilt. Well, there's no law against hiding under a quilt. So he's not breaking the law by hiding under the quilt, so he's still the king's lawful subject. So if you kill him, that's a crime. So what if he's hiding behind an heiress? Well, same thing. There's no law against hiding behind an heiress, so he's still the king's lawful subject, and so if you kill him, it's a crime. But let's take a look under the modern rule, and we would ask this question. Did the killer have malice aforethought? And if he did, then killing the victim would be a crime. So let's say that Polonius is hiding under a quilt and Hamlet goes and stabs him. Well, it's going to be obvious that that's a human being hiding under the quilt. So he can't say, oh gosh, I didn't realize there was somebody under that. So he's probably not going to get away with uh, saying that he didn't have intent to kill. But what if Polonius is standing behind an arras? Well, the arras is going to be hanging flat and you're not going to see that there's a human form behind it. And Hamlet might see a little rustling in the arras, and he thinks, oh, a rat is crawling up it. And he pulls out his knife, and he stabs at the arras, and oh, it's not a rat, it's Polonius. And as you can see, he wouldn't be able to see from the other side of the arras that it was actually a human behind it. And of course, if you think that you are killing an animal, but it actually turns out it's a human being, then it's an accident. You don't have the requisite intent to kill a human being, and therefore it's not murder. So in addition to the insanity defense, Hamlet would have the accident defense because of the way Shakespeare rearranged the fact pattern from what was in his source stories. Now, let's talk about the duel with Laertes. This occurs near the end of the play, and of course this is sponsored by the king. The king asks Hamlet and Laertes to put on this exhibition for the court, for their entertainment, and Claudius is going to be betting on Hamlet, at least publicly. But the audience, who has seen a bit more of what is going on behind the scenes, uh, they know that there's a little bit more going on because they see Claudius and Laertes plotting to kill Hamlet. Now, what they're going to do is instead of using the blunted swords, which are to keep people from getting hurt, they're going to use unblunted swords. And just to make sure, Laertes is going to put a little poison on the tip so that if he can prick Hamlet's skin, the poison will kill Hamlet in a very short time. So what we have here, and the audience sees it all being plotted out, is clearly a premeditated, cold-blooded murder with malice aforethought that they're going to try to make look like an accident. Well, what if it doesn't look like an accident? That might especially be a problem for Laertes, who's the one who's going to do the actual killing. But fortunately for him, there's a rule that at any royally ordained joust or tournament, and this is royally ordained because the king asked them to do it, 
If you kill someone, it's not a felony. So let's say you're jousting at a tournament before the queen and you knock the other person off the horse and he breaks his neck. Well, too bad for him, but uh, you're not going to be prosecuted for that. In fact, you'll probably be the hero for winning the joust. Now, Edward Cook in his fourth institute talks about the many ways that poison can be a feature in murder. And he talks about four types of poisoning. Poisoning by touching, by taste, by a suppository or the like. That's my favorite. <laughs> or by breathing. Breathing would be like a poisonous perfume or something like that. And um, Thomas Glenn Watkin in his article points out that Shakespeare manages to get three of the four kinds of poisoning into the plot of Hamlet. First of all, there's touching with the poison swords that I talked about a few minutes ago. Then there's taste, and that would be the poisoned wine. Now, you recall Claudius sets up a chalice of poisoned wine so that he can have Hamlet drink that if the poisoned swords don't work. He's always got a backup plan. And so, unfortunately, what happens is that Gertrude drinks the poisoned wine, and she dies from it and the suppository or the like. Well, uh, now you're probably racking your brains to recall the suppository uh, in the plot of Hamlet. Uh, actually, it's more the like, and it's something that happens before the action of the play starts, and it's when Claudius pours poison into his brother's ear, into King Hamlet's ear, that's Hamlet's father, and that's how he, he kills his brother and he's able to take the crown and also marry the queen after that. So it's basically, uh, when you can pour poison in some orifice where it will get into the bloodstream eventually. Now, um, next thing I want to talk about is the killing of Claudius, which does finally happen near the end of the play. And of course, Hamlet had resolved early on in the play that he was going to kill Claudius, but he kept putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. And also, I just want to comment on this particular photo that you see here. This is uh, David Tennant as Hamlet and Patrick Stewart as Claudius. And if you do a Google search in Google Images for uh, Hamlet killing Claudius, you will get a lot of pictures like this, which if you're familiar with the play, you will realize is not actually a picture of Hamlet killing Claudius. It's a picture of Hamlet not killing Claudius because this is the scene where Hamlet comes upon Claudius when Claudius is praying and he thinks, all right, now's my chance. Now I can avenge my father's death. And then he stops and he thinks, wait a minute. If I kill him while he's praying, he'll go to heaven. And that would not be a very good revenge for his having sent my father to purgatory. So I'll just wait until a more appropriate moment when I can kill him and send him off to hell. So he delays the killing at that particular point. Now, let's talk a little bit about the killing of Claudius. And I'm going to ask you at some point whether you think this was a murder or a manslaughter. And remember, a murder analysis is based on whether the killer had malice aforethought. He had to have malice ahead of time. And so killing Claudius, is this a premeditated act, an act of murder? Or is it an act of sudden passion? an act of manslaughter, and I'm going to go through the facts of it a bit, and then I'll, I'll ask for a show of hands what you think about that. Now remember that during the duel scene, Hamlet sees his mother die of poison. He learns that he is about to die from a poison sword, and he learns that Claudius is responsible for the deaths of his mother, himself, and also Laertes, who in the spirit of hoist by his own petard, which is also a line from Hamlet, uh, it, Laertes has been pricked by the poisonous sword, and he's going to die from it too. And he's the one who explains to Hamlet that Claudius is behind all of this. Now, as we said earlier, Hamlet decided very early on that he was going to kill Claudius, but there's no indication in the play that he had pre-planned to do it at the end of the duel scene. In fact, he says at one point, the readiness is all. In other words, he'll know when the right time comes. Well, the right time seems to have come because he's only got a few minutes left to live. So if he's going to do it, he'd better do it now. Uh, so what does he do? Well, he stabs Claudius with his sword, and then he forces Claudius to drink the poisoned wine. That way, Claudius will not be saying any prayers that might get him into heaven. 
So murder or manslaughter, I'm going to ask for a show of hands. How many of you think that it's murder? OK. How many of you think that it's manslaughter? OK. It's fairly evenly divided, and it usually is when I ask this question. And uh, I certainly think that you could make a, a good argument that it's manslaughter. But remember, there are a couple of statutes I talked about earlier on that said that malice of forethought is presumed if you stab an unarmed person or a person who has not yet drawn his sword. And there's no indication in the play that Claudius had a sword or that he's drawn a sword. So that would go against Hamlet. That would mean that it's murder. And also willful killing by poisoning. Well, Hamlet has seen that his mother drank the poisoned wine. And she even said, as she's dying, it's the wine. You know? And so Hamlet takes that wine and he pours it down Claudius' throat. So there's probably no way he can say, gee, I didn't know that was poisoned. He just saw his mother die from it. So on both of those counts, it would have to be murder. But I think, I think perhaps Shakespeare is making a, a subtle point here uh, about the law. And that is really that you cannot just isolate one fact and make a decision about whether something is murder based on that one fact. Because when you look at all the facts, you can certainly argue that there's, this is an act of sudden passion. You know, he's seen all these things happen, and, and now all the passion boils up, and, and now he's just, he's got to kill him. There's going to be great anger. And this is probably the angriest that you see Hamlet in the whole play. But because of the way the laws are written, you can't even argue that it was manslaughter. Now, I'm going to bridge over and talk about the law of suicide, which is closely related to the law of homicide. And I'd like to uh, give thanks for a book by R.S. Guernsey, Ecclesiastical Law in Hamlet, The Burial of Ophelia. Her death was doubtful. That's what the priest says after Ophelia's funeral. Well, why does he say her death was doubtful? Well, the question is, was it an accident? Was it suicide? Was it because of insanity? Let's take a look at the facts of the case. Now, we know that Ophelia went out to a brook, and she sat on a limb, and that the limb broke, and she fell into the water. And strangely enough, she didn't do anything to try to save herself. So that's why some people might believe that she went there to kill herself. Well, what was the view of insanity and suicide in those days. Well, actually, there was a conflict in the view of the church and the view of the secular law. And according to the, to the ecclesiastical law, the church law, suicides were not entitled to Christian burial, even if they were insane. So this basically reflects the medieval view. You just look at the actions. The person killed themselves. You don't look at intent or what they were thinking or why they did it. They killed themselves, and that's the end of the story. They don't get Christian burial. But the common law had come to a more modern view of this, and that was that suicide by an insane person was not a crime. And this was basically for the same reason that homicide by an insane person was not a crime. They were not considered capable of forming the requisite intent in order to uh, be guilty of that crime. Well, so what happened in real life? If a person committed suicide, did they actually get Christian burial? Well, there was sort of a compromise. The church would accept the coroner's verdict of voluntariness. So if the coroner said that the person was insane and they didn't know what they were doing and they killed themselves in insanity, it was, then it was involuntary and the person would get Christian burial. But it was not the full Christian burial. It's what I call Christian burial light. It's not all the trappings, not all the, uh, not all the bells and whistles that you would get with a full Christian burial. You might even say it's not the whole enchilada. <laughs> a word not coined by Shakespeare, by the way. <laughs> um, OK, well, now the grave diggers who are digging Ophelia's grave actually give us a lot of information. And they also get us into some of the legal issues uh, in the play that have to do with suicide. Now, one of the grave diggers says to the other, make her grave straight. The crowner hath sat on her and finds it Christian burial. Well, what does that mean? OK, well, Crowner is the coroner, sat on her, basically investigated. And, 
And I think the most interesting word in it, though, is the word straight. And you'll find a lot of annotated versions of Hamlet that define this as straight away, meaning right away. So make her grave right away. In other words, get to it. But uh, some commentators, and Samuel Johnson is one of them, have, I think, what is a more interesting explanation of that word. A straight grave is an east-west grave, which is the proper alignment for a Christian burial. And that's supposed to be with the head at the west and the feet at the east, so that if you can picture the person sitting up in the grave on the day of judgment, they would be facing east towards Jerusalem. So that was a straight grave. That was for a Christian burial. If you were not getting a Christian burial, you might be buried diagonally or north-south north uh, rather than east-west, and you might not be buried in consecrated ground. Well, now the other grave digger can't understand why this is Christian burial. He says, how can that be unless she drowned herself in her own defense? It must be se offendendo. Well, now, what he means is se defendendo, self-defense. Self, se, defen, se offendendo would be self-offense, which actually suicide is, in a way. But um, it, it's quite common in Shakespeare for the lower class characters to misstate the law. And some people will look at that and they'll say, well, Shakespeare didn't really know the law very well because look, here's this legal error, but it's always, always putting it in the mouth of somebody who's not expected to know the law. And it's almost always exactly backwards. So anyway, he says, how can that be unless she drowned herself in her own defense? And this may be a bit of a commentary by Shakespeare on some of the legal treatises of the day, which treated homicide and suicide exactly the same way, even though in suicide, the victim and the killer are the same person. So what, what would this mean, to kill yourself in your own defense? Well, I guess that means you killed yourself to keep yourself from killing yourself. So that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so uh, there's a little bit of a, a, of a satire on the, the legal treatises here. What ceremony else? That's what Ophelia's brother Laertes says at the end of the funeral, because he's concerned that his sister is not getting all the rights that she should get in a Christian burial. Now, we know that she's buried in consecrated ground because there's a line from the priest that tells us that. We know that she gets an east-west grave, a straight grave. So these are some of the signs that it's a Christian burial. There's the ringing of the bell, and there are garlands and flowers. But there's no torch or cross-bearer. There's no holy water. There's no censer with incense. No psalms, no hymns, no blessing, no holy communion. And in fact... Hamlet, when he first sees the, hu the funeral procession from a distance, and even before he knows that it's Ophelia's funeral, comments on the maimed rites. In other words, she's not getting all the rites of a Christian burial. And he says that this is a sign that the person that's being buried must have taken his or her own life. Now let's go back to that question. Was this suicide or accident when Ophelia killed herself? Well, of course, the grave diggers have their opinion on this. And one of them says, if the man goes to this water and drown himself, it is willy-nilly, he goes. But if the water comes to him and drowns him, he drowns not himself. Okay, so this is pretty much the medieval view again. You just look at actions. They know that Ophelia went to the brook. The brook did not come to her. And so if she went to the brook and drowned, it must be suicide. She must have gone there to drown herself. Again, it's just looking at one fact and not really looking at the whole picture. Because for the audience who has seen Ophelia in a couple of scenes where she's acting rather crazy and she's running around in scanty clothing and handing out herbs to members of the court and chanting songs about young maidens losing their virginity, the audience is likely to think that she's gone over the deep end. Not just literally, but figuratively. <laughs> so, the grave diggers go on to say, if I drown myself wittingly, it argues an act. And an act hath three branches. It is to act, to do, to perform. Argal, meaning ergo, or therefore, she drowned herself wittingly. 
Now, this talk about an act having three branches has long been recognized as a parody of a famous legal case called Hales versus Pettit, which was decided in 1562. And let me tell you the facts of Hales versus Pettit. Sir James Hales and his wife Margaret had leased some land for a term of years. And Hales had been a Protestant supporter of the Lady Jane Grey, who, as you may remember from your English history, was Queen of England for about a week and a half. And then uh, the rightful queen, uh, Queen Mary, who was uh, the daughter of Henry VIII, uh, came along and said, hey, give me my crown, get off my throne, and go get your head chopped off. Uh, which is what happened, and so Lady Jane Grey was no more. And, of course, there was some punishment for some of her supporters, and Sir James Hales spent some time in prison at the behest of Queen Mary. And Sir James was rather distraught about the time that he spent in prison, and when he got out, he committed suicide by jumping into a river. Now, some people will tell you that he walked into the river, but as you can see, I have photographic evidence that says otherwise. <laughs> now, what was the legal question in the Hales versus Pettit case? Well, because he committed suicide, the land was forfeit to the crown. So it went to Queen Mary, and she gave it to a man named Syriac Pettit. So Margaret Hales, the widow, sued Syriac Pettit, and she claimed the land by right of survivorship. And she said that her, her claim to the land vested by right of survivorship the moment that her husband died. Whereas the queen's claim did not vest until the coroner declared that Hales was a suicide, which of course was some time later. So Margaret Hales' attorneys argued that Margaret Hales' claim preceded the queen's claim and was superior to it. Well, Pettit's attorneys had an argument of their own. And it went something like this. First of all, they said that the suicide and the forfeiture were all part of one continuous act. Now, I think for attorneys here, this is probably a forerunner of the doctrine of relation back, which, as you know, if you uh, want to amend your complaint after the statute of limitations has passed, uh, you're able to do that because you filed your earlier complaint before the statute of limitations was passed, so your amendment relates back to the time when you originally filed your complaint. So when he's declared a suicide by the coroner, that relates back to the moment that he died, the same moment that uh, Margaret Hale said that her claim vested. And they went on to say an act has three parts. And now it's starting to ring a bell, I hope. And what are the three parts of the act according to Pettit's lawyers? Well, they're the imagination, the resolution, and the perfection or execution. And I want to comment on that, but first I want to just let you know that, by the way, Pettit did win the lawsuit. But let's look at these, these sayings we have about three parts of an act. Now, the gravedigger said that an act hath three branches. It is to act, to do, to perform. Well, that's basically the medieval view. To act, to do, to perform. Those are all synonyms. It means the same thing. It's all about actions. So that is basically the medieval view. You just look at person's actions. You don't look at what's going on in their mind. The modern view is represented by what Pettit's attorney said. An act has three parts, the imagination, the resolution, and the perfection or execution. And of those three parts, the first two are about state of mind. They're about what is going on in the person's mind. So you can see, even in 1562, this change was occurring in the law and people were starting to talk more about a person's state of mind. Now, what does this have to do with Shakespeare's art? As you know, my title of this is The Life of the Mind in Law and Art. Well. Shakespeare, of course, went very deeply into the human mind, and I think probably more than anybody before him by far. And I want to illustrate that by giving you a contrast between what Shakespeare does and what he had in the source story that he was working with. Now, a while ago, uh, I said a little bit about the Belfort version of the Hamlet story of 1570. This is 
from the very original version of the Hamlet story by Saxo Grammaticus, written in 1185. And I'm going to read a little of this to you, and there are two characters I want to highlight. There's Horwendil, who is the forerunner of King Hamlet in the Hamlet play, and uh, Feng, who is his brother, who eventually becomes Claudius in Shakespeare's Hamlet. And so Saxo Grammaticus says, Horwendil's good fortune stung his brother Feng with jealousy, so that the latter resolved treacherously to waylay his brother. Then he took the wife of the brother he had butchered, capping unnatural murder with incest. Well, so let's look at what we know about what's going on in Feng's mind. We know that he was stung with jealousy. And that's it. That's all we know. That's as far as it goes as far as a psychological examination of Feng. And I can tell you this for a fact because if you read the whole story, and it's only about 17 pages long, you will not find anything else about Feng, about what was going on in his mind. You can just assume that he's a bad guy because he killed his brother and, and doesn't even say married uh, his brother's wife. It he took her. Uh, so sounds like a real nice guy. Uh, so anyway, so that's what we know about Thing in the source story. But what does Shakespeare do with this character? Well, of course, he changes his name to Claudius, but he also gives him a soliloquy. Now, Hamlet, the play, is famous for its soliloquies, and a soliloquy is a great tool for getting into a person's mind. And, of course, Hamlet has most of the famous soliloquies in the play, but let's take a look at Claudius's soliloquy. He says, oh, my offense is rank. It smells to heaven. It hath the primal eldest curse upon it, a brother's murder. Pray, can I not? Though inclination be as sharp as will, my stronger guilt defeats my strong intent. Now, this is much more interesting, much deeper, much more nuanced than Feng was stung with jealousy because we see that Claudius has a conscience. And he knows that what he did was wrong. And you can see him wrestling with his conscience. And it's fascinating. You don't know exactly what he's going to do. And this is the kind of thing that sets Shakespeare apart from his predecessors. And I think even from people that followed him. Uh, Harold Bloom said that Shakespeare invented the human being. And I think that's kind of an exaggeration, but I think what he's getting at is that Shakespeare made it fashionable to dig deeply into the human mind because he did it in a way that nobody had ever done it before. And that's what makes his plays so interesting. That's why we continue to read them and continue to love to see them performed to this day. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. If you'd like to ask questions, there's a microphone here. You can come up to the microphone if you've got a question for me. And uh, I'm just going to show some of the references that I used here. And also, those of you who are lawyers, the, you may want to note down this information. <laughs> yes, you can take a picture of it. That's one way to do it. So uh, anybody got a question? Oh. Don't be shy. Do we have to go to the microphone? Uh, you don't have to if you'd rather not. Is, is that all right, George? They can still? It's okay, but then we can't hear you on the tape. Yeah. Great. Uh, okay. okay. Yes, okay, so Megan. My question is, how do you feel that the legal issues in Hamlet relate to other Shakespearean plays as far as legal issues arise? Because I, I find, I love all the topics you touched on in your talk. Yes. Uh, but I find that they could easily, well, Maybe not easily, you'll tell me. They could be applied to other plays as well, but in, you know, in slightly different versions. So have you ever thought about other Shakespearean plays in, in the development of the view of the interior mind and intent? Um, well, I, I think as far as Shakespeare's plays generally, and, and just getting away from the law side of it, I think Shakespeare is in many ways digging into the human mind much deeper not necessarily with soliloquies, but in other ways. He reveals more about what's inside the person and, and their complexity. And you don't, have sim you don't have simple things like, oh, the person was just jealous, and that's all you know about him. Um, there's, um, well, I mean, I'm not sure how far you want me to go with the question. I mean, there, there are lots of legal issues in the plays. I've, I've, looked, I've, looked at a lot, I've looked at a lot of the plays from a, a legal standpoint. And um, 
particularly, I think, Merchant of Venice and Measure for Measure stand out as the most obviously legalistic plays. And uh, I also have a presentation I've done from time to time about uh, law versus equity in those two plays. And I think that's a, a good way to look at the history of the law is looking at you know, how it's developed and how these two sides of the law developed. And they're still part of our heritage. Uh, it's not just law, it's also equity. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. I mean, I, you know, I could talk about it. I taught, I've taught a semester course on it, so I can talk about it for a long time. But. Well, <laughs> A pithy five-minute answer. I think that's an oxymoron already. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, uh, uh, the law is, it fits into uh, Shakespeare's works in many ways. And I wrote an article on this where I talked about seven, seven different ways that Shakespeare uses the law. And some of them are obvious and some of them are very subtle. And uh, you, you start with obvious things like Merchant of Venice where you've got a, tr a famous trial scene. Okay, well that's obviously about the law. And measure for measure there's a lot of talk about a statute that had been dormant for a long time and now it's being revived. And uh, there's a lot of talk about punishment and the purposes of punishment and so forth. So they're very obviously about the law. Hamlet, when I tell people I'm doing something on the law in Hamlet, they, they go, what? There's no trial scene in Hamlet. You know, You don't hear people talking about the law. But once you get into it, you see that Shakespeare understood the law very well, and he crafted some of his fact patterns to fit with the law as it was evolving. And there's also a lot of property law in Hamlet, which I don't even go into because that would take another hour. Uh, but uh, there's there's lots of law in it. And, uh, but he's the law and order of his time. I'm, yeah, I guess so. You might say that. <laughs> yeah. Yes. 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 Very much. Yes. Go Did ahead. Shakespeare have any? legal training such as it was in his day or did he just acquire this knowledge or was he related to anybody who was in the legal field? Okay, well that, that's a very good question. Uh, and it actually gets into some other questions as well. Uh, let me put it this way, I think that the person that wrote Hamlet had legal training. Okay, does that, does that answer your question? No, but I meant Shakespeare. You, you mean the man from, from Stratford-upon-Avon? There's, there's no evidence that he had any legal training whatsoever. How about any family members who were in the law? No, none. Did anyone who is purported to have written things instead of Shakespeare have any legal training? Uh, most of the people who are purported to have written this besides Shakespeare uh, did have legal, legal training, yes. Uh, yes, okay, and Peter, next, Very good, next Tom. question. Very good, uh, uh, Dissertation and Thank you. Uh, some things I, I did not know about East-West graves and things mm -hmm. like that are very, very interesting to me. Uh, when Hamlet finds out that his father's uh, been murdered by his uncle, he, he starts thinking about how he's going to revenge, and he says, I will put on an antic disposition. Right. I'm going to feign madness. Yes. But he doesn't go on to say, because once I kill him, then I'll be free. He doesn't create that defense. He's left, it's left for us 400 years later. But was there something topical in the time that you may have, may have uncovered or in, in various uh, scholarly tomes about uh, incidents of the day that, uh, that the audience of that day would have gone, oh, yes, of course, he's going to feign madness because then he'll, he'll be able to, to uh, plead uh, uh, insanity and uh, not be accused of murder? Well, um, I, I can't say that I, I know of any famous incidents that were happening at the time, but it was, uh, it, it was uh, accepted at that time that uh, insanity was a defense to murder. Um, I, I do uh, think of one uh, incident that happened that it's not exactly about insanity, but it, it has to do with uh, some of these things about self-defense and so forth. Um, where someone killed another person with his sword. Well, at least that's what he was accused of. But the coroner came back with saying, no, the, the victim had actually run upon the other person's sword. And that's how he died. And so it was not a murder. So that, that was a fairly common way of uh, you know, getting around the, the law if they wanted to reach a certain result. Yes, you're welcome. A any other questions? 
Yes, right here. I, I'm moving forward uh -huh. in time. I'm a firm believer in uh, neuroplasticity. I don't know if there's a, I'm not a scholar of, of Shakespeare, mm -hmm. but we do know that testimony is often erroneous mm -hmm. because people say something and they believe it. Mm -hmm. Because they believe it, they actually can make changes in their brain mm -hmm. so that it becomes true to that person. Mm -hmm. Does Shakespeare explore that, that concept of maybe you would call it self-deception or something along the lines of what we know today in neuroscience? Um, actually, Shakespeare coined the term neuroplasticity. Not really, no. <laughs> um, well, I, I think that, uh, you know, there's a particular line, and I can't recall it exactly from Macbeth, where the doctor is talking about trying to uh, cure Lady Macbeth of, of her uh, sleepwalking and so forth, and he says something about the, the patient must minister to himself. And, and I think he is uh, getting into the idea of how you sort of create uh, your, own, your own world, your own truth. And, uh, of course, Lady Macbeth is now in this world of her own uh, where she's sleepwalking, and she can't get away from this, this fact that she was uh, instrumental in the, in the killing of the king. And, uh, but it's, it's kind of uh, like something that is her own fault, something that she created. Um, and I'm not sure that I you know, understand neuroplasticity from what you said well enough that I can, can comment on, uh, on Shakespeare's plays to a great degree, but uh, it, it is a common theme in Shakespeare's plays that things are not what they seem, and that, that people are putting on masks, they're putting on disguises, they're pretending to be something that they're not. You have you know, lots of scenes where you have uh, women dressing up as men and things like that, and people changing their identity in various ways. So I, I think that- The concept feigning madness mm -hmm. to the point where someone can believe that. Well, and yes, and, and, and I think it- become like a mad person. Exactly, and I think in, in Hamlet's case, uh, you, you can say, well, he's pretending to be mad, but then after a while you start to wonder, okay, is he pretending anymore? Or he's just actually gone crazy. Mm -hmm. So yes, uh, uh, I think that, that that's probably an example of it, yes. Okay. Any other questions? These are good questions, thanks so much. Okay, going once. Hamlet, the actual historical character? Not Hamlet, no. Uh, Shakespeare, Shakespeare uh, 1564 to 1616. Playing on that theme of what you said as far as Shakespeare focusing on things that are not what they appear to be on the surface, do you find that he explores that theme more in his tragedies or his comedies? Well, I, I think he does it in both. Both quite a lot. I mean, well, I mean, you know, I mean, it, it's sort of, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's sort of hard to do an instant overview of the plays, you know, like, but uh, in, in Hamlet, for example, I mean, the, Hamlet has this line about Claudius, oh, that a man may smile and smile and be a villain. Uh, so there's that, that role playing there, that uh, situation where he is, uh, you know, pretending to be something that he's not really and, and is, is really a villain underneath. But uh, it happens in the, in the comedies as well. Uh, you have, uh, for example, in uh, Much Ado About Nothing, you have Hero pretending to be dead, uh, you know, and uh, that's, and then you have it in Romeo and Juliet, you have feigned death, and of course it has tragic consequences in that case. In, in Much Ado, it has a happy ending. So, uh, yeah. As you like it. Um, well, you have Rosalind pretending to be a boy, and she's, of course, wooing the man that she loves. She's having the man that she loves pretend to woo her. And so she's actually a girl pretending to be a boy, pretending to be a girl. So it's the first picture they took. Yeah. It's, it really is. Well, and if, you think, and if you think about it, if you think about it, too, in those days, the women were played by boys. So the boy who was playing Rosalind, you've got a boy playing a girl pretending to be a boy who's pretending to be a girl. That's a deep character work. 
Yes. So I, I said, you know, Shakespeare goes more deeply into the human soul than anybody else. So, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, yes, and back here, and then the next. Yes. Uh, in the sense of, is, does he rule himself, or, or what do you mean? Right. Uh, right. Well, so if he kills himself, it wouldn't be a crime, because <laughs> if Hamlet kills him too. Well, now you may recall when he stabs Claudius, some people in the court shout treason. You know, he's killing the king. But if, if you say, well, hey, he, he killed the king before him unlawfully, so I'm just killing the, I'm just killing the person who killed the real king. But that wasn't so, generally known. Before. It's not known by the people in the court generally. That's true, yes. And yes, over here. Who decided or how was it decided if somebody was insane? Well, I'm not, I, I don't think, I mean, even today they don't have necessarily real good ways of figuring that out, but uh, I think back then they had to just go by the person's behavior. Oh, like take him to court and say he's legally insane? Um, you know, I'm not really sure uh, about uh, the specifics of that. Uh, I, the way it's work, it works in Hamlet and the way Thomas Glenn Watkin explains it uh, in his article is he says, well, you know, it's, everybody just knew that the insane were not culpable uh, for a murder, and so when Hamlet kills Polonius, they've already, everybody's already seen that Hamlet is supposedly insane. So Claudius asks Gertrude what happened, you know, wh what was Hamlet like, and she says, mad as the sea when both contend which is the mightier, you know. So nobody takes a step to uh, punish Hamlet or anything. Claudius does send him off to England, which in that, those days was considered a punishment, but, uh, but, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Uh, but, but yeah, no, nobody thinks of, you know, punishing the poor crazy person for what he did. Uh, so I, th I think it was probably treated that way, at least uh, in the early stages, you know. People could just see the person was crazy, so they didn't do anything as a punishment. Yes, any other questions? Uh, Peter, yes, yes, another question. Of Big, the big question uh, about Hamlet is, why doesn't he do it? Why, he doesn't, can't make up his mind. That seems to be the great psychological uh, construct that has made this play so great. Yes. Um, is, so the, the question I'd like to ask is, does that somehow um, tie into the theme of, of murder and homicide and, and uh, uh, that's not a, it's not a defense, but um, could it be could it be some kind of a, a defense that uh, I had a conscience about it, mm -hmm. e even though it, it was it's it's a revenge it's a it's an act of revenge, mm -hmm. uh, and it it is we've been arguing lawful to kill the man who's been a criminal, mm -hmm. so he's taking justice into his own hands. I don't know if the Danish court would allow that. Mm -hmm. But would it be a defense to say that uh, uh, I wasn't sure if, if I had an I was I was reluctant to kill him, I but, reluctant. but I had to do it anyway. Um, I, I don't think that's going to stand up in court too well. Uh, because basically, you know, the premeditated means you thought about it ahead of time, and you were in a calm state. Uh, a sedato animo is one of the phrases they use. Uh, and what, what, what? what was phrase? Sedato animo. Uh, so, um, yeah, so, I mean, the thing is, it's more of a defense if you did it suddenly as an act of passion. That's why I talked about manslaughter versus murder. But it's, you know, when you've had time to think about it, and you could have said, oh, you know what, I'll, maybe that's not such a good idea, but I'll do it anyway. Even though I know it's wrong, I'll go ahead. But where it's a, a sudden provocation, and of course the, in legal stories, the classic is you come home and find your wife in bed with another man, and you kill them both, or kill one of them, or whatever. Uh, that's, that's sudden provocation. You're suddenly so angry, you just can't resist. 
So if you've had a time to think about it, that seems to be less of a defense to murder uh, than if you didn't have time to think about it. And that's why I said, you know, it is arguable that when he does actually kill, Ham, uh, kill Claudius, that it's sudden provocation, you know? He, he finds out Claudius has done even more dirty stuff, and now it's, you know, he's, he's got to kill him at this point. And he's, he should be really angry at that point in the play, probably the angriest that he is in the whole play. He's gone through an incredible journey. He's planned it. He's had Malice forethought, but then he's stepped away from it, too. Yes, it's he has. Right. Can't do this. So he's he, he's at a point till the end of the play where he's not he hasn't he's pulled away from being a murderer. Right. And and as some critics have pointed out about the play, if he had actually killed Claudius when he first had that opportunity when Claudius was praying, a lot of the homicides that occur later in the play probably wouldn't have happened. It probably would have all ended right there. And and uh, there's an interesting book on, on, uh, on Shakespeare and the Law by Kenji Yoshino where he talks about that. And he says, what Hamlet is looking for is he's looking for perfect justice, right? I'm not going I'm I'm to send this guy to heaven when he sent my father to purgatory. I'm going to wait until I can send him to hell. I want perfect justice here. But the trouble is, in his quest for perfect justice, a lot of innocent people end up dying. So... You know, can you really get perfect justice? Is it is it worth is it worth fighting for? Yes, over here. Well, getting back to the soliloquy again, because yeah, I mean, I'm wondering if there's that part of the sort of irony that where he says, "Pray, can I not?" Mm -hmm. So that Hamlet does not kill him because ostensibly he's praying, but in fact we find out here he's actually not capable. Absolutely, absolutely. That is part of the irony of it. You find out later that he actually couldn't pray. So probably Hamlet should have gotten him then, but you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. <laughs> That's not a line from Shakespeare. <laughs> so you could argue that this tragic, well, Hamlet's tragic flaw, and this is a tragedy, and every tragic hero has a tragic flaw. Mm -hmm. It, that's one way of looking at it, yes. Yes, and I thought uh, Kenji Yoshino made a, a very good point in, in his chapter on Hamlet there. Yes, next, over here. I was asked you to think about if someone can look at another person and make some decision about that person's afterlife, is he going to go to purgatory or heaven or hell or whatever? Does that not apply to himself as well? Okay, so are you saying that, that perhaps, like if he kills somebody knowing that it's going to send somebody to hell? If his intent was to get revenge, the fact that he didn't do it at the count of three, and it took him three more, what's the difference? Mm -hmm. Well, it, does it make a difference, though? Does it make a difference for Hamlet's own salvation that he's, per that he's, yes, that he's purposely killing somebody at a time when he can send him to hell? So... Yeah. Well, and then self-reflection. Yes. If he has that capability to think about someone else's, that he has, you could, one could infer from that that he has that perception about himself. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Hey, these are good questions. This is a very smart class. I, <laughs> really. Thank. Thank you. Any Any other I'm questions? Not sure what the, the, the beliefs are about heaven and hell during the, the this time. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I, I'm yeah. I'm not a theologian either. So I'm. So yeah. I'm not really sure either exactly. But yeah. And also, if you say at, at that time, are we talking about the time that the actual historical Hamlet lived, or whatever time this is set in, which is you know Shakespeare kind of creates his own world. Uh, 
Yeah, exactly. Eng like English law in, in Denmark, you know, he kind of creates his own world. And, and the, I think the fact that, uh, well, where did Hamlet go? To, where was he going to college? Where, where, starts with a W. Where, Wittenberg. Wittenberg. And what's that famous for historically? The Protestant, yes, Luther, the Protestant Revolution. So, um, yeah, so, and I think there's got to be a comment there uh, about all that because that was very much in people's minds the difference between Protestantism and Catholicism. And that, that was something that people had wars over in those days. So, you know, I think that, uh, that probably plays into the play quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Right. So <laughs> it's any decision he happens to come to is it's it's basically his mood in that moment. Right. Obviously he didn't soak up the lessons at Wittenberg very well, did he? No. <laughs> yeah, no, well it, it may be it, that may be intentional the contrast there, you know. I, I mean there's so many things that the author so many elements that he puts into the play and there's so much knowledge behind so many things. They're they're always very heavily freighted with meaning. So you can argue about the meanings and over and over and, and endlessly. Yes, Peter. What, what do you think then is the tragedy of Hamlet? What, what is the ultimate tragedy of the, this prince who finally ends up murdering and dead and, uh, and doomed? Well, I, th I think you just pretty much said it right there. <laughs> he ends up dead and doomed and uh, well, no, I, I, I think um, it's part of what I said about he's trying so hard to be perfect that he actually causes more damage than he might have, da have caused if he'd not been so concerned about that. You know, if he'd just gotten, if he'd just killed Claudius when he had the first chance, when he was at prayer, then look at all the people that died after that. Many of them, maybe most of them, or all of them might not have died. He was also curious, though. He, went, he had to go see the ghost, right? And then the ghost, he gets all this information from his father. Right. And then he set on this path. And you said, yeah. Right. Well, and of course... He starts off as this aristocratic, brilliant mind who becomes corrupted by his own curiosity, I guess. Yes. Well, the thing is, he says, the, ghost, the spirit that I've seen may be the devil, and the devil hath power to assume a, sh a pleasing shape. And, and, you know, perhaps tempts me to damn me. So it, it maybe the ghost is really the devil, and it's not really the ghost of his father. So that's why he wants to find out if what the ghost said is true, and that's why he stages the mousetrap play. Because when he sees Claudius's reaction, when they do something that's very similar to what he did when he killed his brother, and, you know, Claudius just gets up and stops the play and storms out of the room, he says, oh, now I know. Now I know the ghost is right. So that, that's a whole long process, and that's about halfway through the play where you have the mousetrap. And uh, then a lot of things happen after that. Claudius immediately sends him off to England. And uh, there's a whole series of things that happens. He gets captured by pirates and stuff like that. So um, yeah, he, he, never, he doesn't get the chance uh, for a long time to come back and, and finish off what he started. He doesn't have a chance to act on his knowledge that Claudius uh, killed his father, which he's finally sure about after the, the play. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, well that, this class gets all gold stars. You were great. You had good questions. Thanks so much. Thanks for paying attention. <laughs> and a CLE credit if you're a lawyer, yes. yes. Oh, the sources, let me go back to that. Yeah, right there. yeah if you want to get that. Oh, yes, you're welcome. Well, thanks for coming.